We are testing the new microphone. It's very exciting moment, lavalier mic, so my hands are free, totally. Welcome to the new episode of Ask Gleb podcast. This is episode number six and I'm Gleb Alexandrov. You ask your questions and I will answer them. I feel very sorry about the delay in answering your questions, but today I'll try to answer them all from the beginning of time. I will start with a question by Skycrafting. Skycrafting asks, are you going to make video tutorials for Blender game engine, shading and lighting and other cool stuff? I have a gamer DNA, because when I was 14 I was obsessed by gaming. I just spent all the time playing, uh, playing StarCraft and WarCraft and I was a fan of Blizzard games, but all sorts of other stuff as well. For example, I was a huge fan of Doom, obviously, because when I first saw this 2.5D <laughs> shooter, I immediately know that I want to make something like that. I want to make computer graphics for the rest of my life. That's what I love doing. So you can expect me to make video tutorials for, for game engines. For uh, I know how to use Unreal and uh, Unity 5, but honestly, I don't think that uh, right now Blender game engine can compete with Unreal and with Unity. It's just impossible if you compare the budgets and, and so on. But I would prefer, you know, the workflow that has originated in Blender. I would prefer to, to be able to model and to play test at the same time and eventually offline rendering and online rendering they will converge you can see that the real-time applications already are using PBR physically based rendering and global illumination and so on the workflows that were first adopted in the offline environment they are migrating to real time and that's incredible that's freaking awesome Jim asks Gleb when are you going to do tutorials focusing specifically on PBR model and GI in Unity 5. And as I said, PBR is physically based rendering and GI is global illumination. The S warming stuff that, <laughs> that things, global illumination and physically based rendering uh, first appeared in uh, offline rendering. In 3ds Max, in Maya, in uh, Blender, you know, of course, Cycles to some degree is a real time application because it allows us to preview our stuff in viewport in real-time 3d and i'm super happy that offline methods and techniques are coming to real-time 3d that means that if you know blender that if you know uh, offline visualization techniques you're welcome in the world of real-time graphics I'm going to do tutorials on PBR and global illumination, especially on global illumination because, you know, I'm a lighting fan. I write in a book about lighting, so global illumination is just what I'm very interested in, especially real-time global illumination. It's pretty cutting edge in today's technology and I will talk about it. Abhijit asks, hey Gleb, can you make video about light portals in Blender, getting a noise-free renders? is very very hard thing especially in the interiors to make a noiseless render is a pain in the ass so i welcome the addition of light portals to blender and i think that it is the solution i need to test it today and bushan i'm sorry if i mispronounce your name asks what part of 3d editing do you like to do the most i like to stare at the render buckets on the screen when I have already made all the models and all the textures and I like to visualize, yep, and I like to set up the lighting. Apogit asks, what do you do when the system is rendering? What's your favorite hobby? And you can see that all the questions are linked somehow. As I've said, when my system is rendering, I'm just staring at the render buckets moving across the screen. That is very hypnotizing of you, it mesmerizes me. I love to stare at render buckets. I'm just kidding, to drink some coffee. And what about my hobby? I try not to uh, make a separation between the life and the work. That's it for me. I, I don't have a hobby because everything that I do 
it somehow converges into the point where shooting now this Q&A session and that no, is not my hobby, that is my life. I love communicating with you, that is what I am, that is my life. So I don't have a hobby, not a single one. But maybe coffee drinking and playing in the rock bands. My car asks, crazy idea, any chance you'll release the cutouts of you in funny outfits for other people to use in their work? Micah, thanks, thanks so much. When I made this train's render, I first positioned low-poly 3D models of people. Later on, I replaced them in composite with uh, the cutouts of me in various outfits. You know, it was a very funny process. You know, first you do uh, 3D models, low-poly stuff from BlendSwap, free models, and then you replace it with your photos made with correct perspective and scale. That is nice, nice, nice one, nice thing. That's all right, my microphone. I'm just afraid that my microphone will get broken as in a previous podcast. I would need to use the gestures. Mohan asks, I'm unable to find our podcast on iTunes with the name Ask Gleb. What should I search for? I contacted the su support of iTunes and somehow we have managed to bring it back to the search. You can use Ask Gleb in the search of iTunes and Find it like no problem. Massimo asks, what considerations should I take into account when I choose a texture for my model size? Tiling, definition, near-far camera. Uh, you, you already named the most important things. <laughs> the, the size of the model in the scene, the distance from the camera. Uh, please consider the actual size of the model on the screen. The actual size is the size of the model in the scene, plus or minus the distance from the camera. For example, if we compare it to lighting, how do we know how big or how small the light is? We take the size of the light, the physical size, you know, and we take the distance into account. For example, the sun is pretty big star, it is very distant one. So for us, for us, the sun becomes a very, very small thing, you know, and we have a sharp shadows because of it. And it's very big, but it's distant. When you pick the texture, consider these two things, the size of the model and the distance from the camera. One tip related to texturing. In your source files, in PSD file, when you're composing texture, you use the highest resolution uh, textures that you can find. But when you export it in, uh, to use it in Blender, you can export it is in different resolution. For example, you can use a proxy textures, a textures in lower resolution, because when you have a dozen of uh, 4K textures in your scene, it is becoming slow to render. In some cases, it's advisable to work with the proxy textures that you import in Blender. But in the source file, in PSD, you have full resolution and even more than you need. Because you don't know, maybe you would need to make a close-up of the scene. Bogdan asks, how I can quickly switch to Blender if I already know 3D's Max, Maya, ZBrush and so on. <laughs> and made, you will have no problem switching to Blender if you already know 3ds Max and ZBrush. You just know everything. I, I don't know. 3ds Max and ZBrush are the foundations of what you need to know about the interfaces in uh, 3D modeling creation suits. So we won't have a problem migrating to Blender. Just try it out. But maybe you would have a problem with a right-click selection. And Jeremy Baker asks, when you were first getting started, how much did you learn from tutorials and how much did you learn from doing things? That's a great question. I tried to absorb every bit of knowledge. When I tried to learn After Effects, I watched pretty much every tutorial produced by Andrew Kramer from Video Copilot. And when I was learning Blender, I watched Andrew Price's tutorials, but don't get stuck in tutorial zone. Because when you're just watching tutorials without practicing, you will get stuck in tutorial zone and that is no fun. Uh, learn by practice too. Do things. Classy Dog asks, do you work in Blender CG every day? Or do you feel it is important to set aside days when you leave work alone? And yes, it's very important to set aside days when you do nothing. And it's very easy to say this because I love to procrastinate, you know. Today I was playing Kingdom Rush, the tower defense game, and half a day. And I'm planning to devote a few more hours to that 
spider attack because I just can't figure out how to how to solve the level number eight. I try to erase the separation between life and work. If you love what you're doing, that's okay to spend 18 hours a day and still be a happy person and still not get very tired of it. Silas asks, when did you start to do all this stuff? You know, I started smoking when I was 17 and I quit when I was 22. And I still sometimes want to smoke. And if you mean computer graphics, I started producing teapots of first first signs of my future obsession with computer graphics when I was 14. I installed 3ds Max version 5 and I tried to make a pyramid. And later on, I managed to make a teapot. The microphone still works. David Maxwain asks, your blog and tutorials have a nice graphic design aesthetic. How long did it take to develop and are there styles you aim for? I like how thumbnails look on Smart Passive Income blog by Pat Flynn. He incorporates uh, the title of the article in the thumbnail. I think that works pretty well. And also I think that uh, the text in the image can boost the conversion. It's clickbaiting technique, you know. It's all about clicks. I don't care at all, I just love how it looks. And Nereus Uranus. I wonder where can I ask questions or making conversation with you. Feel free to absolutely to contact me either on the site or on Facebook, everywhere. We live in transmedia world and every person is transmedia. We speak, we talk to each other across the different platforms and genres. Feel free to ask your questions using AskGlab hashtag. That was Gleb Alexandrov for creativeshrimp.com. And thank you so much for your questions. Take care and we'll change the world of computer graphics together if I just won't die of drinking too much coffee today. Boop, boop, boop.